The final week of waiting is upon us because we have so many notices of an imminent Starship flight and the excitement is building. We have hazard notices from every corner of the globe to support SpaceX's official date and you're about to get a full rundown in your Starbase update. Just before we get into the major developments surrounding Flight 3, let's take a look at how the rest of Starbase has been shaping up. Over on the infrastructure side of things, we saw the delivery of more tanks to the port of Brownsville. Time will tell when they'll be transported to Starbase and where they'll be placed. SpaceX is starting to build up quite the collection at the port as they're still storing the tower segments there as well. The end of an old friend is looming on the horizon as Booster 4 saw the beginning of grid fin removal this week, which means that scrapping is most likely to hit Booster 4 very soon. While it never flew, it helped pave the way for the boosters to come with quite an extensive test campaign a couple of years ago. Of course, at this point, Booster 4 already extended its stay for a very long time as it is a very outdated prototype that can no longer be used for anything apart from taking up space at the rocket garden. More work on fences and walls is also ongoing at the production site as SpaceX teams are still working on the infrastructure overhaul. Star Factory saw more wall panels added this week and more roof segments are also going up, so it seems SpaceX is closing in on the final footprint of the facility. And now we have some really good news. Following a lot of speculation, it turns out we will get glass on the front of the Star Factory. That is great news as we might be able to peek in, although it could just be for a non-construction area. Internally at Hawthorne, they do have massive windows looking into construction areas, so I think it's safe to keep our hopes up. This week, not only have we seen major development with the Flight 3 vehicles, but we've also had to pay attention to Ship 29, the second stage for Starship Flight 4. Whilst it is not the star of the show at the moment, it will be pretty soon. It is currently at suborbital pad B and SpaceX early in the week disconnected the two-point lifter which was used to lift it from the stand. We then saw action below Ship 29 as heavy inspections were ongoing in the engine bay. This is usually before a campaign of engine testing, either a spin prime or static fire or both, to make sure the vehicle is ready for flight. This is nothing to worry about. An SPMT with a transport stand then entered the suborbital stand area. While we can see Ship 29 on suborbital pad B, it's important to note that this might be the last test campaign on this stand as SpaceX is preparing the Massey's test site for future testing. The suborbital stand will then be replaced with the second orbital launch pad. Speaking of that, foundation work is ongoing at the suborbital site. As you can see, two pile drivers are already working around the area where the new pad will go. The expectation at this stage is that the stand will see replacement and work as soon as Booster 10 and Ship 28 clear the pad. But this is not the only thing happening in this clip. Ship 29 stretched its legs, or fins I should say, after being folded inwards for its roll to the pad. We've sped this clip up, but the movement is still very quick in real time. Ship 29 then roared to live with its first major testing on Stand B. With no overpressure notice issued to residents, this was lined up to be a spin prime test most likely. However, after fueling the vehicle and getting everything ready for said test, the spin prime never happened. It seems like SpaceX ran into some issues close to the end of the countdown. It of course could always be a pressure or tanking test, however these are now conducted at Massey's and it's unlikely they would do these at the suborbital stand. We've stretched this out long enough so let's take a look at the flight stack. These two vehicles are approaching the most intense week of their lives. Before we saw the required D stack we saw some grid fin testing. If you cast your mind back, the grid fins were the main reason for the delay of Flight 2 by a day from November 17th to the 18th last year as one of the grid fin actuators was damaged, so it makes sense to get this testing done early. And then it was time for what is hopefully the final D-stack of the Starship Flight 3 stack. The quick disconnect was disconnected and Ship 28 was lifted into the air. While this D-stack is going on, let's focus on all the regulatory and news things that happened this week. The first item, people found SpaceX's official broadcast for Starship on X.com, which was suspiciously scheduled for Thursday, March 14th. This could have been a placeholder, of course, but it was our first hint that something might happen. 
and the signs then got stronger and stronger. The strongest sign probably being that SpaceX itself confirmed the launch attempt this Thursday. The website updates and tweets from SpaceX gave us a lot more information about the upcoming flight test and we're going to talk about them. A big change from the first and second flight is that SpaceX this time around will target a splashdown in the Indian Ocean instead of near Hawaii, which means the ship will only cross the Atlantic and then already be on its way back down. This is to enable things like the in-space engine burn, well, according to SpaceX, maximizing public safety. This also means that the beautiful Flight 3 patch designed by Pauline is now a little bit wrong, but hey, people still love it and we only have limited stock, so if you want one, get one whilst you can. They will conduct this in-space burn to demonstrate the ability to relight Raptor in space, which will be needed for countless maneuvers on future flights, including the ability to perform a deorbit burn. The payload bay door, welded shut on previous flights, will also open and demonstrate demonstrate its capabilities as it is scheduled to stay open for the duration you would expect it to if it were to deploy a bunch of Starlink satellites. It seems like SpaceX wants to get ready to launch payloads very soon. Of course, SpaceX notes that all of this planning, the timeline and the schedule is dynamic and likely to change as this is part of a developmental test campaign. We also have road closures for the flight, which are March 14th to March 16th, starting at midnight local time and going on for 14 hours. The road closure notes, this closure is for flight activity under license number volume 23 to 129. This is in contrast to all the other documents mentioning that those closures are not for flight activity. The marine hazard zones are all scheduled as well, noting hazardous space operations each day from 7 to 11 in the morning local in the Gulf of Mexico and beyond, starting on March 14th. And the window was narrowed down by the Mexican NOTAMs issued by the Federal Civil Aviation Agency, the country's equivalent to the FAA. Apparently, on Thursday, Friday and Monday, Starship will have a roughly two-hour window, while on March 16th and 17th, the actual launch window will be closer to about half an hour. It's interesting to note, should this launch slip or scrub a bit? So where does this leave us? Well, we still need an FAA launch license, temporary flight restrictions from the US and an evacuation notice for the flight. NSF reached out after the release of the launch window to the FAA to ask if the FAA sees a possibility of a Starship launch on Thursday and if the launch license will be out on time. The FAA told us that there is nothing to update at this point. SpaceX's to-do list extends beyond the regulatory side of things because the hardware still needs work. A big focus this week was the thermal protection system on Ship 28. A team of engineers has been constantly working on the TPS, testing it and replacing poorly attached tiles. SpaceX has an increased focus on making sure the TPS is ready to demonstrate at least part of re-entry if they get there. As SpaceX probably needed a bit more access to the TPS and since Ship 28 will stay on the ground for a few days, the chopsticks were disconnected from the ship. One of the critical spots of the TPS seems to be the area of the two-point lifter, where tiles regularly get damaged. It is right below the flaps where teams here had to repair a bunch of tiles. But that's not the only area. One of the tiles on the main body was also replaced as it did not get the OK written on it. Once inspected, the new one got the white OK marking. But not all work is on Ship 28. Booster 10 and the orbital launch mount have also seen some lifts and cranes as the first stage is being prepared for the flight. A good sign we got was the removal of the booster alignment parts being removed from the RLM. These are used during lifts of the booster as they help align it during the final meters. This at least confirms that SpaceX has no more plans to remove the booster from the pad. At this point, it's become tradition. One of the chines was opened close to flight once again. This area holds CO2 tanks and composite overwrapped pressure vessels, which hold helium. Here we can see one of the COPVs. It looks like SpaceX wants to inspect and potentially work on this very critical area of the flight a bit more before it becomes inaccessible. There was one more great piece of news we have for you in this action-packed week. The flight termination system explosives, which are usually stored in the small container next to the launch pad, was collected and carried to the vehicles. These charges will help to terminate the vehicles if something goes wrong, like we saw quite dramatically on Flight 1. You can see the boxes where the charges are placed. This multi-hour operation is driven by safety and ensures that everything is done properly. As far as we can tell, the system was successfully installed and will be software armed closer to launch. But on the hardware side, the pins should be pulled and the system should be ready. 
And with that, the next Starbase update should be after the next flight of the world's most powerful rocket. Assuming that we're still on track for Thursday, we'll be going live at 0400 UTC, so make sure to click the stream link in the description to set your notifications for when we go live. Also, if you don't want to do the maths of converting universal standard time, you can also just click that link, it will show it in your device's local time. I'm Ryan Caton for NSF, thanks for watching, and goodbye.